Good morning, everyone. This is Miss Nuke from Vibe Barber College. Today, I want to talk to you all a little bit about Chapter 10. It's dealing with properties and disorders of the hair and scalp. A lot of times, you know, this is why it's so important to make sure that we do scalp analysis because once you start to give the client the service of the haircut or the shampoo or the shave or whatever it may be, at that point, it's almost too late to go back and then do a scalp analysis um, because you've already discovered that there was a disorder in the hair or in the scalp. So just please make sure, no matter how much of a rush that you're in, that you always be sure to do a scalp analysis. It's for you and also for the client, because sometimes clients don't know what's going on with their uh, hair or their scalp. They may say, yeah, it had been itching over there, but they may not have actually gotten a mirror, checked it out or anything like that. So just please um, make sure that you're doing a scalp analysis. I wanna start the chapter with saying that first of all, okay? So um, in our introduction, we have the structures of the hair, um, the hair root, hair shaft, chemical composition of hair, uh, hair growth, hair analysis, hair loss, uh, disorders of the scalp, common disorders, um, and then as we go down, you all have a couple of learning objectives. It's about eight for this chapter in the gray or the platinum looking textbook. So the technical understanding of hair structure is important to providing knowledgeable and professional services to clients. That's what makes us a professional, right? Is that we have the knowledge of the services and even as far as the client's hair and scalp is concerned. Uh, the professional responsibility is to proper care and treatment to maintain hair in a healthy condition. That's our goal. Uh, trichology would be the scientific study of hair, its disorders, and also its care. Um, hair, is, hair protects the head from heat, cold, injury, and hair is also used as an adornment. The structure of the hair within the description, which is an appendage of the skin, is a slender, thread-like outgrowth of the skin and scalp. It's composed chiefly of the protein keratin. The hair root and the hair shaft is the portion of the hair beneath the skin surface. It is enclosed within the follicle. The hair shaft is the portion of the hair extending above or beyond the skin surface. And your textbook have a couple of visual uh, pictures and you wanna make sure that you read through those. The structures of the hair roots. So the main structures will be the follicle, the bulb, the dermal papillae, the erector pili muscle, and the sebaceous glands. So with the follicle, it's a tube-like depression in the skin or the scalp. Uh, it encases the hair root. The follicle encases the hair root. It also extends down from the epidermis on an angle into the dermis, and it surrounds the derma papillae. Uh, the bottom of the follicle contains a finger-like projection called a papillae, uh, from which new hair is developed. There is a variance in the follicle depth depending on the thickness and the location of the skin. A follicle for every hair, but more than one follicle can grow out, more than one hair can grow out of one follicle, okay? Um, the mouth of the hair follicle is the breeding place for germs and also an accumulation of sebum of, or dirt. And we know that sebum is just oil. Uh, let's see. So the hair bulb is a thickened club-shaped structure. So it's shaped like an actual club. Okay. It forms the lower part of the hair root. 
the lower part of the hair above is hollow. It's actually hollow. Um, and it fits over and covers the derma papillae, okay? Then the derma papillae is a small cone-shaped elevation um, at the base of the hair follicle. And the derma papillae fits into the hair bulb. The derma papilla contains capillaries responsible for supplying oxygen and nutrients to the follicle. Let's see, the epidermal tissue surrounds the papillae and forms the hair bulb. The blood and nerve supply are vital to growth and regeneration of hair. Nourishment reaches the hair bulb through the papillae. Nourishment reaches the hair bulb through the papillae. Please make sure that you remember that. A healthy papilla results in new hair growth. Uh, sebaceous glands, which are small sac-like structure with ducts attached to each hair follicle. So the sebaceous glands will secrete sebum that gives hair luster and pliability. Uh, factors associated with sebum production would be the diet, uh, the health of the hair can decline if you don't have necessary food elements for it. Uh, emotional stress is also linked uh, to the health of the hair. If your hair, if you are stressed out emotionally, your hair can begin to shed or thin out. Um, that would be associated with your nervous system. The endocrine glands, which is a hormonal in nature, it influences the hair and other aspects of your health. And another factor associated with um, sebum production would be drugs. So certain medications may also affect the hair adversely if a person takes uh, high blood pressure medicine. Nine times out of 10, you're going to notice the area right here in their head, right at the apex where it could be hardened. The scalp won't be movable. Okay, it'll be hard in nature where it won't move. And another thing is that the hair will begin to thin in that area. A lot of times with clients that have high blood pressure, people won't tell you that they have high blood pressure and you're only to really ask them if you are performing some type of a facial service on them. So you kind of have to just feel around yourself after you wash your hands to see how the scalp is actually, um, how it feels, if it's movable. All right, um, let's go on down with erector pili. Erector pili is a minute involuntary muscle fiber in the skin. It is attached to the hair follicle. Um, the erector pili muscle is considered to be like goosebumps, like if someone uh, pops out and they scare you, they go boo or raw. Okay, so those little things, those little hairy like things on you, they tend to stand up. They'll stand straight up. They'll stick straight up. So it's fear. Um, cold can also cause the contraction and make the hair stand up. And another key fact is that your eyelashes and your eyebrows, uh, they lack an erect pili muscle, okay? Structures of the hair shaft. So we got layers of the hair shaft. We got the cuticle, the cortex, and the medulla. So the cuticle will be the outermost layer of the hair consisting of a single overlapping layer of transparent cells. Uh, another thing about the cuticle is that it has scale-like cells that point away from the scalp toward the ends of the hair, okay? Um, another thing about cuticle is that his hair's primary, primary defense against damage uh, is a healthy and it's compact cuticle layer. Uh, certain chemical solutions soften and will raise the scales to allow absorption by the cortex. So when you're using a chemical, that chemical is penetrated through the cuticle and that's how it's able to be able to process, okay? 
Uh, the cortex is the middle layer of the hair. It's a protein core and it has melanin pigment. That's the cortex. The cortex is also about 90% of the total hair weight. It comes from the cortex. The cortex is also a protein structure. It provides strength, electricity, and natural color to the hair. The cortex changes in hair during chemical services. Uh, they occur within the cortex. Uh, medulla. Medulla is the innermost layer of hair. It's composed of round uh, cells. And the male beard hair contains a medulla. So a mature male beard is considered to be a medulla. The medulla may be absent and very fine, or if the hair is naturally blonde, the medulla may be absent. Let's go on down with chemical compositions of hair. So hair is composed of protein. It grows from cells originating within the hair follicle. We have keratinization, which is a mature of the, the cells are mature and they are filled with keratin. Uh, that's when the hair loses its nuclei. The hair shaft will be a non-living fiber composed of keratinized protein. Protein will be the essential organic compounds necessary for life. Uh, another thing about protein is that it's made of long chains of amino acids. You have five elements that make up amino acid. They are considered to be cons. So CONS is an acronym, all right? So CONS is carbon, um, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur. And then the percentages are in your uh, chapter, in your textbook, chapter 10. Um, nature of hair protein. So peptide or M bonds would be chemical bonds that join amino acids end to end in a definite order. Peptide bonds are the strongest chemical bonds in the cortex. Uh, peptide or M bonds also join each amino acid to form a polypeptide chain. And you also have a chart in your book um, as an example for a polypeptide chain. Uh, most strength and electricity of the hair is attributed to peptide bonds, and there is no way to reform broken peptide bonds. All right, so then we have the chemical process and the rough treatment of hair uh, can break peptide bonds. We have polypeptide or polypeptide chain, which is, as I said, a long chain of amino acids joined by peptide bonds. Then we have side bonds, cross bonds of the hair. The hair cortex contains millions of polypeptide chains and they are cross-linked uh, by side or cross bonds to form a ladder-like structure. Then we have hydrogen bonds, which is a physical cross bond. It's easily broken by water or heat. Hydrogen bonds are easily broken by water or heat. Our individual hydrogen bonds are weak but numerous. Hydrogen bonds also account for about one third of the hair overall strength. Hydrogen bonds will add body to the hair and it helps to keep parallel chains of polypeptides together. Another name for hydrogen bonds will be H bonds. Um, let's see, let's move forward with salt bonds now. So salt bonds would be physical cross bonds that react to changes in the pH. So um, salt bonds account for one third of hair's total strength. It's easily broken by strong acidic or alkaline solutions. The sulfide bonds are covalent bonds that join sulfur atoms of two neighboring cysteine amino acids to create cysteine. The sulfide bonds are stronger than hydrogen and salt bonds, but they are fewer in number. Uh, the sulfide bonds account for a third of the hair's total strength and are not broken by heat or water. 
The sulfide bonds require chemical solutions to change or restructure. Uh, another name for the sulfide bond, also known as sulfur bonds, S bonds, or cystine bonds. Hair pigment, hair pigment. So natural hair color is the result of melanin pigment found within the cortex. We have EU melanin and FEU melanin. EU melanin would be brown to black. FEU melanin would be um, blonde, ginger, red tones uh, in hair. Then we have wave patterns. So a wave pattern would refer to the amount of movement in the hair strand. A uh, wave pattern description would be straight, wavy, curly, or extremely curly. Wave patterns result genetics, uh, the racial background, all found in each racial or ethnic group. Then we have hair shapes, which is a cross-sectional view of the hair strand. Hair may assume the shape, size, and direction of the follicle. Um, straight hair is usually round. Wavy hair is oval. Extremely curly hair is almost flat. Um, hair growth. Hair, uh, hair, pres hair is present all over the body except for the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, your lips, and your eyelids. Okay, you have um, three main hair types. You have vellus, which is lingo, which is the fine hair on the cheeks, uh, the forehead, um, and the body, it aids perspiration and evaporation. Then we have primary terminal, which is that short, thick hair. It grows on your eyebrows and your eyelashes. Then we have second terminal, which is long hair found on the scalp, the beard, the chest, on their back, and on the legs. Uh, the average growth of hair from the scalp would be one half per month. Uh, growth is not increased by shaving. That is a old myth. Uh, trimming, cutting, or any type of uh, ointments or oil applications. All right. Um, you have normal shedding with hair. If it is your eyebrow hairs or your eyelashes, they are usually replaced every four to five months. You have growth patterns. So working with hair's natural growth pattern produces a more natural looking haircut and style. Uh, hair streams, that's hair that flows in the same direction. Two streams flowing in opposite directions form a natural part in the hair. Then a whirl would be hair that forms in a circular or a swirl uh, pattern. And then a cowlick would be a tuft of hair that stands straight up. So that's like a person getting their, uh, their alfalfa on if they have a cowlick, okay? Uh, growth cycles, we got antigen, which is a growth phase. That's where new hair is produced. Um, and the antigen phase can last three to five years. Then we have cantogen, which is a transition phase between growth and resting phase. The follicle shrinks at the cantogen phase. The hair bulb disappears and um, shrunken roots ends forms a rounded club. And cantogen can last for about one to three weeks. Telogen is the resting phase of the hair. It's going to last three to six months until a fully grown hair is shed. About 10% of the scalp hair is in telogen phase at any one time. And with telogen, the growth process repeats itself every four to five years. Let's move forward. Let's talk a little bit about hair loss, okay? We have alopecia, alopecia. So that would be the technical term for any type of abnormal hair loss. So types include androgenic alopecia, alopecia areta, uh, alopecia senalis, and then we have alopecia symphyletica. 
So you want to make sure that you go through the alopecias in your textbook. Then we have a couple of treatments. Uh, we have two treatments. You have minoxidil, which is a topical treatment. It's applied to the scalp twice a day. Um, it's a non-prescription drug. It's actually available for men and women. You have um, two strengths for minoxidil, and it doesn't have any known side effects. The second one we have is the Finistry, which is a oral prescription medication, and it is for men only. Um, let's see, then you have a surgical treatment, which will be a transplant or how some people get hair grafts when they find out that they have um, any type of alopecia. A couple of common disorders of the scalp would be pityriasis. Pityriasis is just dandruff. Um, the difference between dandruff and dry skin is that dandruff has a stench to it and the color of it and the feel of it is um, on the oily or uh, greasy side. It has a scale-like um, structure with dry scalp is usually just white flakes and it usually does not have a smell to it. A lot of times customers, um, they don't have actual pityriasis dandruff. A lot of times they just have dry scalp. And if it's a young client, um, like a kid or a child, usually it is that they A, use bar soap in their hair. And so the scalp just caked up like white, like a lot of white flakes in the scalp from the soap drying the scalp out um the second thing with kids or children is that they could not have rinsed all the shampoo out of their head out of their scalp so a lot of times it's not pityriasis it could be one of those two factors all right um, okay, so then we have um, a contagion. So a contagion is once thought to be contagious. Um, it should be treated as contagious. And a lot of times when you have clients that have pityriasis, I just want you to know that it is highly contagious, highly contagious dandruff is. Then another scalp disorder we have would be tinea. Tinea would be the medical term for wingworm. Um, it is a vegetable parasite as in a fungi. It is highly contagious and easily transmitted. Um, it's characterized by itching, scales, and sometimes a painful circular lesion. And that circular lesion can have little dots um, on the inside or the outer parts of it, okay? That's tinea, tinea. Then we have animal parasites, which could be pedunculosis, capitis. That would be an infestation of the hair and scalp with head lice, head lice, pedunculosis, head lice, or head louse. Um, Head lice can live off of the human body for up to 48 hours. That's why I tell a lot of students to make sure that you're not just keeping um, antiseptics and disinfectants at your station, but you also need to keep some type of a, um, something to safeguard as far as for parasites. So whether it's a raid or something like that, because even after you've bagged everything or you've thrown everything away and the client is gone, you broke down your workstation, you washed your hands, they can still live up to 48 hours just on the surfaces of other things that they may have jumped on or around. So you always wanna make sure that you have some type of a pesticide, a pesticide at your station as well, okay? Um, let's talk a little bit also about scabies. Scabies will be highly contagious skin disease. Um, it could be associated with itch mite, all right? Um, if suspected cases should be referred to a physician for medical uh, treatment. Those are things that come in with your scalp analysis. 
Uh, you got to do that because you're you're looking for things like that. Um, forbid that you get started on a haircut because you did not do the scalp analysis and then you run into a problem of this sort. Um, it's absolutely terrible. Okay. Um, let's go further down just a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about gray hair. So gray hair would be canitis with a C. That is the technical term for gray hair. So gray hair is due to the loss of the hair's natural melanin uh, pigment in the cortical layer. Uh, gray hair is the same as pigmentated hair. Gray hair grows out as gray. Um, Another thing about gray hair is that it has more keratin in it. Um, gray hair can be stubborn and it can add a glare to it when you are cutting it. So just be mindful, very mindful of, um, of gray hair. So it's acquired, it may be to natural aging process. It could be genetics. It could be illness. Um, some people, I've known people where it has actually been their both their birthmark. So gray hair, gray hair canities is would be the technical term. Um, you have a couple of review questions in the back of this chapter, and quite a few review, um, you know, as far as the terms are concerns so you want to make sure that you're going over the terminology and you're doing the review questions in the back of chapter 10. I want to thank you all. This is Ms. Nuke from Bi Barber College talking about chapter 10 properties and disorders of the hair, skin, and scalp. Have a good day.